I couldn't help but notice today that with all the coverage of the March for Our Lives in Washington, that there were still some people missing from that conversation. Now I understand for identity politics, they put certain people in place, yet there's still a community of people missing, and I think that community needs to have representation. So son, several years ago, you, your mom, and your sister were out, and I was meeting you guys. Before I could get there, a bad guy noticed you guys. He ran over towards you with a gun. Your mom had to jump in the back seat of the car to shield you and your sister. I showed up right in time. I made him stop. How does that make you feel? Did my family is safe because you were there? What did he have that he was going to cause harm with? A firearm. What did dad have to make him stop? A firearm. Hmm. Sweetheart, does daddy love you? Yes. Are you my world? Yes. Are you my everything? Yes. Does daddy have guns? Yes. Does daddy allow you to get hurt with guns? No. Are we a safe family? Yes. Are we a responsible family? Yes. And what is daddy to you? My hero. Oh, wow, oh, you're <laughs> so sweet. And what is dad to you? The protector of the family. And what are you gonna be one day? The protector of my own family. Hmm. It's kind of funny that they don't give us any camera time. They don't want to speak to the real, true American families. They just want to give you one imagery. They don't want to show you everything. Gun owners are not evil monsters. We are not people that are out murdering children. I love my kids. I love your kids. I love our communities. We just want to make sure that we have the right to protect ourselves from evil people like the man that attempted to kill my wife and kids. And I don't see anything wrong with that. We are a loving family and we are gun owners. Too bad America won't show you that. Is your child defiant, independent, annoyingly inquisitive? After a long, hard day of following the rules, who wants to deal with troublesome kids? 49% of children suffer from Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD. Symptoms of ODD include independent thought, rampant creativity, and failure to submit to authority. But now there's a solution. The good people at Pilfer can help you with their time-release, once-daily capsule, Compliacin. Your child won't be able to form his own opinions, let alone express them. It maintains your child's ability to go to a state-run school and perform simple tasks around the house. You won't have to worry about parenting, and the school won't have to deal with your kid asking questions. Compliacin. You'll go from this. Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! To this. Good morning, Mother. I love going to school. And this week we're learning all about how the government is our federal family and they're here to help us. Compliacin. Talk to your school psychiatrist and ask for it by name. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and solpodcast.org. That's Seeds of Liberty podcast. So today I am delighted. Actually, before I get into that, uh, we have um, also we're covered by the Bipcot No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So today I'm delighted to have a guest. I first heard about him on the Tom Woods show. He was a guest there. Uh, his name is Kevin Dixie, and he's with the No Other Choice um, business in um, in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, he's a uh, a gun uh, educator, um, advocate, um, also I guess uh, advocate for um, you know right to protect yourself and your family, and uh, and things like that. So we're going to talk about that and what what he's been up to in St. Louis. So Kevin, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Oh man, thanks for having me. How are you? Good, good. Yeah, I, uh, as I said, I heard you on the Tom Woods show, and I was really impressed with what you had to say and the things that you're doing. You know, educating. I think I think you focus on um, people like in the inner city, right, in the poor neighborhoods, right? Uh, that's that's it, it, so. It's a little bit of a misconception about that. The answer, the ultimate answer, is yes and no. Okay. So um, there is a particular focus because of who I am and where I come from, and okay. I'm from that environment. So there's a an immediate relationship that is easy to build. Uh, however, we're all humans. We're, we're all people, and I'm here for everybody. Excellent. So oh. it's a yes and a no. <laughs> well, I love yeah. to hear that too. <laughs> awesome. No, I mean, I mean, yeah, it's true that we all need, um, you know, we all need 
education in that field, but 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 it seems like, especially in the, in the cities where uh, gun restriction is e even more heightened, and therefore gun violence is even more heightened. You know, this kind of what you you're, what you're doing is even more necessary there. Would you would you say so? I, I would agree to that. It's um it's kind of like thinking about fighting a war, right? You, know, you got you got all the divisions of Department of Defense, and you're going to go fight this war. Well. Everybody has something different that they do better, right? So if we're trying to win the war of freedom, then I have my segment that I'm best at, and that's where I focus on because that's where we, we the people, really need me right now. Yeah. Oh, you definitely do need you. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah. So well, before we get into that, please um, get into your your background, how you got into this field, and why you started your company. I'm going to try to give you the short, condensed version. So um, I spent, uh, I am from the, the inner city of St. Louis, from an area called Walnut Park, one of the, the city's worst areas, if not the worst. Uh, but that's not to glorify it. It just is what it is. Um, my upbringing consists of most people come outside, you go to your local corner, you normally see an intersection or you see, you know, neighbors or maybe a, a cafe or something of that nature. When I walk to my corner, there's a tombstone retailer. Um, so imagine being in the inner city, living four doors down from a tombstone retailer. So when your friends die, they get buried across the street at the city largest cemetery and you watch their parents buy their tombstones. Kind of an interesting environment to come up in. Um, so uh, saturated in violence. And, you know, the short version is I want to do something about it. I didn't want to be another statistic. I didn't fit any type of stereotype. Uh, I believe my control of the English language was was suitable to be. Um, accepted and respected in every part of society. Um, so I refuse to to give up and I refuse to become a victim of it. So um, I decided to, I wouldn't say escape, but reposition myself. And when I turned, to, when I got away and I turned 21, I decided that, you know what, the best way to help is to become a police officer. <clears throat> That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to be a cop. Now, I went into the CDPD. I was 21 years old. I was working for a cable company at the time, right? So I drove up and I had my little amber light flashing so they wouldn't give me a ticket for I can park like in one of the restrictive spots where they can think I'm in there like installing cable or fixing something with the cable. So mm -hmm. I go into human resources and I tell the sergeant standing there, you know, I'm going to be a cop and it's going to happen today, you know, in a very eloquent way. <laughs> uh, sergeant laughs at me. Uh, at the time, I was a really, really, really heavy guy. I was pushing, pushing 400 pounds. Wow. Um, really heavy guy. So, but he liked my enthusiasm. So right away he gave me a job, like almost on the spot hmm. and what we call our uh, prisoner processing division. And it's basically the jailers if you wanted to sum it up. So I took the job, didn't even know what it was, didn't care. I had a job and I was working with, with a police department. That's all I cared about. And it was better than installing cable in my opinion. Hmm. So I took the position. I didn't know it involved firearms training, had no idea. So the first day we get to work, you know, you show up for a new job, you go through orientation and all that good stuff, fill out your paperwork. Um, I showed up and they're like, all right, everybody in the back of the paddy wagon. I'm like, this is not what I signed up for. I signed up to put people in the back of the paddy wagon, not <laughs> throw them in the back of the uh, But we get in the back of the, back of the paddy wagon and we go to uh, the police. We go to the police firing range. And thus began my journey with uh, firearms. So ultimately it was like, okay, um, I have access to all this firearms training, all this self-defense training, coming from the area where I come from. I know I want to make a difference. I'm already talking to people, mentoring them, helping out where I can, giving the best advice I can as a 21-year-old man, right? But I definitely have some insight. At 21, I related a lot better than somebody 41 to a guy that was 16. So uh, always going back talking, and, and I it just started the journey there. And about a few years into learning firearms, uh, where I, to the point where I felt comfortable training people, um, I just decided, you know what? I want to keep helping people, though. It's more, it's more than about the gun. Uh, how can we help communities? How can we help people have better lives, whether they carry a gun or not? Um, and so eventually what, what No Other Choice turned into is a mash of them both. Um, how can I teach you how to protect your life, but also when applicable, help you build a better life hmm. and also break the monotony of what a gun is, since the name No Other Choice. The way that I teach firearms is from a de-escalation standpoint. A lot of times you will hear, you know, Murder, death, kill, company this, or mm. tactical zero, blow you off the earth, murder this, tactical gun range type training. And that's cool. I mean, we're actually, at the end of the day, we're all teaching people how to defend themselves and give them a skill set. But I wanted something that was a little bit more approachable. Mm. Something where people can say, hey, you know what? I should be at the point of no other choice before I ever use any type of uh, positive violence, I'll call it, against anybody. So 
um, I took the two, mashed them together, and here we are. So, so, no, so the uh, <clears throat> the phrase "no other choice" basically means uh, <clears throat> if you have no other choice, you would be happy to have a gun. Basically, right? is that is that the definition? Would you say? Well, you it? it's, it's kind of twofold. So, there's the philosophy behind it that every day your feet hit the floor. I don't care if you're a farmer, a construction worker, an educator, a firearms trainer. I don't care what you are. Every day your feet hit the floor, you have no other choice but to make it the best day possible in the pursuit of your dreams, period. No other choice. Every day you get up. Every single day. When it comes to the firearms, it transfers. Let's just say, for for a loose example, let's just say the law, the in black and white, the law gives you something the size of a, of a say, a Volkswagen. That's where you can operate at with self-defense and be safe doing it. I want you to operate inside your own moral compass. And let's make that the size of a basketball. And that's where I want you to stay. So even if the law gives you room, I want you to operate inside your own moral compass and make sure you're at the point of no other choice before you ever enact any type of violence. That means you've tried to run your way out of it, talk your way out of it, avoid it at all costs. You've begged and pleaded. You've done everything but sacrifice the safety of yourself or the safety of someone else. But everything before that, you've done that to try to avoid the problem. If the problem persists and you're going to be hurt or somebody you love is going to be hurt, then you can respond. But you should be at that point of no other choice before you ever do, even if the law gives you room. I don't worry about the law of the land it's until you try to violate it. But I'm talking about making sure that you can sleep at night, making sure that you know that if you had an opportunity to spare a life without causing harm to your own, that you can do that. So that's that philosophy. Yeah, and what really uh, amazes me is um, how you know people are so fearful of guns because of what they see on the media, on the you know the mainstream news. And what, what's what's kind of amusing is that basically all they all they portray is the you know gun violence done right. They don't they don't often portray the amount of times that guns actually prevent loss of life. <laughs> <laughs> and help to protect I. people's families and save lives like that's many 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 fold more than uh, than the lives that they take and yet people are so you know saturated with fear because they see this and also i also like to point out that that you're more likely to die in a car crash than you are from a gun <laughs> but nobody thinks mm. twice getting into their car to go to work <laughs> nope because the car is something everybody feels they there's that key word they feel like they need their cars right, right. Right. And then they try to turn around and tell you what guns you should or should not have because you right. don't need them. I'm like, yeah, you don't need a 10-cylinder vehicle either to get back and forth. You can ride a bike or, you know, get a smart car. But yet you want to try to regulate what I can own. It's crazy, man. Hypocrisy at its best. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, there's so many there's so many arguments to dismantle, you know. And then, then there's the one that says, um, you know, what? You know, after I say that, they're like, well, but a gun is only used to kill somebody. You would only buy a gun if you want to kill somebody. Why else would you buy a gun? It's like, wait, wait, hold on. You've never had to defend yourself. Maybe you've been living such a comfortable life that you haven't been in that situation. But a lot of people do have to do that. And, and you know, like you said, uh, trampling on that right is, is really, really heinous. Yeah, it's, it's something that needs to be completely left alone. Now, we're getting background checks that the ones we already have in place that nothing's wrong with. Um, yeah, I'm OK with you going somebody, you know, buying a gun and you going in the store, filling out a 4473 like we already do and getting your guns. I'm cool with that. All right. Um, but anything beyond that, that we that we already do generally, if you're buying, you know, a handgun or a rifle or a shotgun or even an AR lower, if you're not even putting the whole gun together. You already have to go do a 4473 on that. We don't need anything else, right? And the only reason I'm okay with that is because I don't want some guy walking up to you saying, I'm going to murder you, murder you, murder you, and you know he's psychotic and he's been in the hospital for 50 years and he's coming out like I'm still going to kill you. And we don't know, you know, that he, we want to be able to control him being able to go get something, right? But other than that, there is no reason for you to interfere. And it's all this opinionated. And I tell people this, and I think that's something that goes remiss. Listen to a lot of people that talk about taking gun rights. Listen to them and listen to what they say. And some of the some of the best language is always used in the gun buyback programs that local police departments are put on or, well, politicians make their police departments put on, rather. Uh, they'll put on these gun buyback, gun buyback programs. And I've heard it several times. They always say the same thing. They'll say something along the lines of this. We already know the criminals aren't going to turn the guns in. 
but we need you to give us your guns that you can turn in for that gun doesn't wind up in the, the hands of someone that causes harm. And mm. then they sell you, they sell you the paranoia. Right. And so here's my question. And this is what, all I perceive out of that. OK, so you already said, you know, the criminals aren't going to turn in guns. Well, I like to tell everybody, you know, my, I have a saying, understand things in their complexity, but be able to execute and explain them with simplicity. That being said, by you saying and, and uh, stating the words that we don't want that gun to wind up in the hands and we know criminals aren't going to turn their guns in. Listen to most of the gun buyer programs will tell you no questions asked, right? You come turn in the guns, no questions asked, give you a gift card or something like that. Mm. Well, you can't say we know the criminals are aren't going to turn are going to turn the guns in because what you're essentially saying then, if you if you understand it from a simple uh, view, simple point of view, that means I can go kill, commit a crime and then have you destroy the gun, right? Then how are you ever going to solve the crime? And as a police department, as a, a government agency, I can't convince people of that, right? But essentially, that's exactly what you're still doing. You you could you could easily be erasing physical evidence of a crime, right? But deeper than that, what you're telling people is, I don't trust you. I don't. I don't trust you. And a lot of the fear of them not trusting people, it starts with themselves. You don't trust yourself, right? And you're trying to cast that energy onto me. So we can go all day long about why or why or need or need. It's really not, it's really not that complex. You don't trust yourself. And you say it in your language when you speak. You don't trust yourself with this kind of quote unquote power, mm -hmm. these quote unquote deadly instruments. You when you say, I don't believe you should have. No, you don't believe you should have. <laughs> you don't trust your own self. When people argue against guns, I mean, look how angry they get. Right. 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 They don't trust themselves to control their tempers. They're always yelling on TV and having fists. And we're all human. We all get emotional one day or another. I'm not saying we don't. Mm -hmm. But you, it's a constant barrage of these angry words and protests and yellings. And I can tell you, man, for being, being on the pro-gun side, we get more death threats from people that are anti-gun than if wow. anybody else. You know, <laughs> that, that's, I, that's ironic. <laughs> Isn't it? You know, oh, I hope you die. I hope, I hope you get murdered. I hope you, oh, you know, all these things happen. Wow. You know, and these people say those things. So what you're really telling us is you don't trust yourself. Whatever demons you have in you, you believe they exist in everybody, and you're not the exception to the rule. And what I would like for them to realize is, Criminals and you guys, the, the people that want to take rights away, you are the exception to the rule. Everyday average Americans don't have a problem with carrying a firearm every day and not harming them. I mean, I can hit you upside the head with a hammer, right? <laughs> I don't do it. I'm sorry, I lost my mic there for a second. I don't do it because I know it's not the right human thing to do to you, right? right? Why would I do that? Why would I cause that kind of harm to your life? Yeah. And they ignore the fact that blunt objects are used four times more likely than any firearm. So right. uh, I don't it's it's trust issues within themselves man in short it really is yeah i think uh i forget what the exactly the title of your video was but it's like it's like we need to ban this horrible thing and it's killed you know this many people and it's very dangerous <laughs> and you hold up oh, the yeah. kitchen knives <laughs> I, <laughs> I really yeah. i like it what's going on guys it's katie with no other choice just coming today with a quick message about the tools being used to hurt our families and especially our children around the country now look whether you feel like this tool is protected by the Constitution or not, let's be honest. At the end of the day, people are dying, people are being hurt, and we need to do something about it. Politics aside, all the rhetoric aside, what are we going to do? Because there are some people like these individuals that have suffered, these kids. Isabella Martinez, Diana, Dakota, Dylan, and Axel Romero. I wonder how their family feels about what these tools have done. Sophia and Noah Murphy. I wonder if we felt any pity for them. Genesis and Serenity Freeman. Not enough for you? Okay. Nadria Janae, Ariana Decree, Ajaya Royale. Well, if that's still not enough, I'll give you a bonus. How about Lucretia and Leo Krim? All these beautiful children under the age of 15 years old were murdered in this country within the last couple of years by this dangerous tool. But, hold, hold on. Sorry, guys. Ugh. Ah, players mess up. They were hurt by these dangerous tools that you argue are protected by the Constitution. I'm not really sure if they are or not. I don't know, but I do know that these instruments, these sharp cutting instruments, these tools, 
are used four times more than any rifle of any sort in this country on a yearly basis to cause harm. And that includes to our children. So if we're gonna have an open, honest conversation about that, we need to talk about knives too. I want you to go over to London for a second. Type in on your little computer. And I want you to see what these are being used for over there. They're nothing more than instruments. And next time, before you get into the debate about you know what's causing harm and what's hurting us, I want you to think about a couple of things. One, this tool is actually protected by the Constitution. It's something we can talk about, but it is protected. These were around at the same time the Constitution was written, and for some reason, they weren't put into it. And yet they cause more harm. Let's be honest about that. Let's also remember that you need a background check to possess one of these in this country. All you need is a few dollars to go buy one of these things and you're good to go. And trust me, in case you find one of those $130 ARs, even with that amount, how many of these can you get? Hmm. These put food on the table. These prepare the food. So before you start arguing about 30 round clip of zines that go into these, I want you to consider these. At the same time, I want you to think about this. Now I'm not gonna give this woman any credit because she doesn't deserve it. I'm not gonna give her any notoriety. But what I will say is there's a mother in this very country that took these and stabbed her own seven year old son 173 times then turned around and killed the five-year-old she was babysitting and she wasn't done there. She then murdered the dogs in the house. All with these. So, 173 times, right? That would be the equivalent of roughly six of these or two of these. I guess you can go full semi-auto with these as well, huh? This is Katie with no other choice. And I want you to be prepared for when there is no other choice including having a conversation about the tools that are truly causing havoc in our country. Yeah, that, that video was, um, oh man, what was the title of that video? Um, we need to ban these things or something like that. Yeah, I think it was like a ban. Um, oh, let's talk about what's, I'm gonna have, now you're going to make me look it up. But yeah, that was a, <laughs> that was a, that was a good one. And that's the one where I actually was standing there and I had the AR slung over my chest. You know, and everybody was like, yeah, you know, like, yeah, ban them. And like no dude these two kitchen knives are what i'm yeah. yeah and it's the truth so it's a way to give people information mm. by diversion you know mm. i mean you're so focused and when i divert your attention mm. to the the real tools that are causing harm they're like oh it makes you swallow it it's like oh crap and then you go look it up you can go look it up all day long mm. i mean i'm not making up stuff and i don't believe in pulling stats from independent researchers the stats i love are from the federal government mm. i i just love those stats when fbi puts out stats here. No bias. They're just putting out the numbers. I love it. Yeah, I think that the key word that you use is tool. This is a tool, right? <laughs> just like any any inanimate object that, that human beings manufacture uh, that we we use to improve our lives, make our lives more comfortable. Um, you know, it's a tool, you know, just like I tell people, just like a computer, just like a car, just like a chainsaw, just like a knife. It's a tool, right? And it's not good or bad. It's an inanimate object. <laughs> when you ascribe good or bad, that's ascribing moral agency, right? And that can only be ascribed to free, free thinking human beings, right? P people who can make choices. Those, th then you have, then you have moral decisions to make, right? So I, I wrote a, I wrote an article for my website, um, and I called it uh, "Evil Resides in the Heart, Not in the Tool," right? It's always in the person with the intention of what they want to do with that tool. That's that's what we have to address, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think it's, you also said in one of your videos, you know, get, getting at the root of uh, of of the problem is necessary. You know, why do people, you know, why do people want to hurt other people? You know, is it, you know, um, traumatic childhood? Is it, you know, medication side effects? You know, uh, mental illness? Uh, so many different things, right? So I thought that was a great point. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to, and that's what, the, that's what the, and I know we'll get to it, but that's what the, later, but that's what the whole point of aiming for the truth is. But when when people are, when they're having a conversation about quote these quote-unquote tools, I like to like to bring up 
stats when I can. I'm not a really heavy stat guy because I believe most of the arguments rely on stats. Mm. And so the reason why people debate me so much is because I don't use them. So they feel like they can – still then they start talking. And then once I get them to talk and I don't use the truth, honestly, to, to shut them up, I like for them to give me information before I can educate them all the way down the line. <laughs> but we had – 87 i just came back from nra annual meetings right i'm still i'm I'm even like i told you when we before we start talking i'm gonna pump my energy up dude because i'm just drained from the annual meetings right yeah so i'm everywhere we're shaking hands we're, we're people are intermingling taking pictures and there are guns everywhere there were over eighty-seven thousand people at the nra it broke the record it was the largest convention uh the annual meeting convention ever hmm. over eighty-seven thousand people hmm. and how many people got shot <laughs> right, <laughs> and it was in Dallas, so you can imagine it was in Texas, man. So how many people were carrying guns? I, I'll be nice. Out of eighty-seven thousand, I'm going to say sixty of them had guns, just to be just to be polite about the number, right? right? So, um, <laughs> how many people got shot? And and I mean, you're talking about eighty-seven thousand people in one space. Can you imagine all the people bumping into each other, and yeah. you're kind of in each other's space? You know, you're <laughs> nudging, you're frustrated. You know what I mean? Like, but yet nobody got shot, even with all those aggravations, those natural aggravations going on. Um, yeah, so I don't, if, if guns were an issue and then 87,000 people <laughs> in a space being inconvenienced about the other people standing around them, yeah. all trying to get to the same areas, it'd be an issue, but it wasn't an issue because it's not the gun, right? It's the operator of the firearm. Right. right. And there were 87,000 plus people that own firearms that were like, Hey, I know what these things can do. I'm around a bunch of other people that have the same capabilities I have, and we're going to be respectful. Armed society, peaceful society, perfect example. 87,000 people is like a, I mean, that's more than a lot of suburbs and municipalities have. Mm. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah, and, uh, and and how many, uh, you know, how many uh, mass murders, uh, mass murder shootings have, have been in uh, gun shows or, or like gun shops or, you know, things like that, where you think, wow, this is the most, most amount of guns here. Must be such a violent uh, place. Oh, actually, you know what? I want to ask you, um, but uh, I, I wanted to discuss the aiming for the truth. Con- it's a conference, right? That you're going to be putting on? Uh, it's a, it's an, an event we put on. Cool. Yeah. So it, I guess you can call it a conference. I guess you can call it a, really more of a seminar if you're going to title it like that. Okay. But it's basically, it's a, it's a community event. Awesome. All right. So before we get into that, I have one question I wanted to ask before I forget. Um, I, I had a friend that was saying, well, you can just walk into Walmart and get a gun. Okay. <laughs> now, I, I don't know that I know the, the laws are different in each state, right, for mm-hmm. uh, for gun ownership. But I know in New Jersey, <laughs> that is not the case. <laughs> New Jersey is one of the, I, I believe it's one of the strictest uh, states, I think, um, to own a gun. And I I, uh, I haven't really researched it, but I, I, I can pretty much bet money that, no, you cannot just go into Walmart and walk out with a gun. Well, he's not totally incorrect. It, because in Missouri, Walmart, they, now they don't sell handguns, uh, but they do sell long guns. Okay. Unless they've taken them out recently. I haven't been in a Walmart in the gun section in a while. Um, but Walmart qualifies as the FFL. So they, they have a gun dealer mm. in Walmart. Walmart is also a gun dealer, so okay. no different than going to an ABC gun store. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can go on Walmart. You can do a background check. You know, they do they can do background checks right on the spot, and you can buy your your gun and your ammunition right there and um but, walk out. But but, but does it depend on which state the Walmart is that the like if oh yeah they 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 have to abide by their local state laws. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. So whatever state it's in, they have to comply with those laws. Yeah, like in New Jersey, uh, I got to go to my my local police department. And then they do like a background check, and I think it takes like six to eight weeks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, so uh, I I don't think that's the case in New Jersey, <laughs> and that's and that's just for a long gun. That's not even for a handgun. I think oh yeah, for a handgun. So you need that in addition to, uh, like I think it's like four or five people that you've known for at least twenty years. That's not your family. <laughs> I can what? vouch. I can vouch for you as being a good human being. <laughs> that is crazy, man. That is. That is ridiculous. So, so how about your state? How is the uh, how's the gun regulation there? Missouri is um, we've came a long way over the last decade. Missouri is one of the best uh, states for a freedom and gun ownership that there is. It just it's just one of the best. Um, you know, you 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 we have a concealed carry uh, law. You know, so you can get your concealed carry permit here. We've enacted something that's, in my mind, questionable, and that's our our version of constitutional carry. But when you start reading the law, I don't really think it protects people like they think it does. 
So I don't know. That one that one probably has a lot of room for improvement, but we do have it. Um, but yeah, once you have your, um, your, you take a valid state ID, well, it has to be valid. You go into your, your authorized gun dealer. If you pass your 4473, your standard uh, federal background check, buy a gun. You know, and you can, uh, there is no waiting period. Uh, I can still carry permits. You know, you have to take an eight hour course. Um, that background, now that background for that permit does take four to six weeks on average, depending on where you go. Uh, it takes between four to six weeks. They do come back sooner. I've had students get theirs back as short in three or four days. Um, but they'll do an in-depth background check on your fingerprints and really get into you. Um, but yeah, you can, you can, as long as you got an ID, man, you can, uh, and pass a background check, you can, you can own a firearm. It's, it's pretty nice. Yeah. And, and, um, let, let me get your, your opinion on this, cause this is kind of how the way I look at it. Uh, cause my, <laughs> some of my friends who, you know, are very wary of guns, you know, they you know, they're, they're like so many people like we need more, we need more back, you know, longer background checks and we need, you know, stricter regulations and we need to, you know, make it more difficult for people to own. And, and the way I look at it is, well, that's not actually going to prevent anything because the people who actually do are stupid enough to commit crimes and kill people with guns. Most of the time, they're not legal gun owners <laughs> or the gun that they own is not even there. Like it's maybe stolen or gotten from the black market or, or whatever. So it's like th those kind of laws completely bypass <laughs> the criminals anyway w w what's your take on that your point is is, is right so I, I you know i'll only give you a thumbs up to the point you what, made so, so basically all, all it's making is it more difficult for the good people to protect yeah. themselves yeah and if you if you if you were talking about a, a good person that's here's the thing man to that philosophy of you should wait longer for your background check they're on you're going rah, rah, rah. okay look man <laughs> if if i decided that I was going to commit a crime, me, myself, and I, right? Which I would never do. Mm, but let's right. just in an alternative world. If right. I said that I was going to commit a crime, I am no different than a, 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 a very, I wouldn't say small, but I would say not uncommon group of individuals that literally probably can't tell you how many guns they own. So if I'm going to buy another handgun to add to the whatever amount I have, if I wanted to commit a crime, I don't need a new gun to do it. Right. right. <laughs> uh, I'll use one of the ones I already have. Matter of fact, I'm not going to use my new gun because who wants to mess that one up, right? So <laughs> you, you just use one of the ones you already have. Uh -huh. uh, so it doesn't, what, what background check? It doesn't stop anything, right? right? So, and if a good person snaps and they lose their mind, mm. you know, for whatever reason, you know, a guy's been owning guns for 30 years and one day he commits, he starts to commit a crime. Mm -hmm. Okay. He waited 30 years. What did your two week, six week <laughs> background check do for that? Right. You know, right, he right. waited 30 years. And if I know that I have an intent to kill, fine, man. These these killers, you you take these school shooters for example. These kids have thought these things out. The Aurora shooter thought this thing out. Like he booby trapped his apartment for Christ's sakes, right? Hmm. They think these things out. The the terrorists in Orlando, in which by the way, all of them are terrorists. Let's just get that out the way. Right. Uh, but the terrorists in Orlando, if they thought that out. That was methodical. The guy in Vegas methodical so i say that to say if you're going to implement a background check let's say two months across the country we fight a tooth and nail we lose two months to own a gun fine in my plans i'll wait two months big deal mm -hmm. you're not gonna stop i'll just plan it around it if you if you if you want to do it legally <laughs> yeah i mean if, if i want if i want to say cool i'm going to i'm going to shoot up this place mm. and i'm going to plan this out Fine. I know I need to wait two months for a gun, so I just write that into my plans. <laughs> All right? And I'll right, let you right. do your background check. I'll wait the two months, and then I'll go execute my plan. Right? So it's not you look at like if you look at the kid in Florida, as he's an idiot. But if you look at him, he didn't want to die. Mm. Think about what he did. All right. He'd been to that school long enough to understand that Scott Peterson wasn't going to do a damn thing. Mm. He knew that, and people overlooked that fact. What like, What did that? What did Cruz know about him that said, you're not going to do anything to stop me? Mm. I mean, if you spend two, three, four years walking around the same person, you kind of start picking up vibes off of them. You know, you get to know their mannerisms a little bit. So what intel did he have to already know that guy is not going to do anything? Because if the kid wanted to die, if Cruz wanted to lose his life, it was an easy way of doing it. Right. Fight it out with the cops when they get there. Mm. Yeah. He dumped everything and tried to blend in with the students to get away. Yeah. Hence, he thought about what he was going to do. 
So if you had him on a two month background check, he would have just planned it for a different time. That's it. You know, and may he burn in hell, mm. but he would have just planned it for a different time. So what are your background checks really doing? No, you just simply want to control people to make you feel more comfortable. The feelings are look, the law and myself, I don't care about your feelings <laughs> when it comes to my rights. I don't care about your feelings because if I came and tried to tell you, hey, I'm passing this new uh, zone law in your neighborhood because I feel nobody needs more than a quarter of an acre of land. That's what I feel because all this land, it's, it's greed. This is, glutt- this is gluttony. You don't need this. I'm taking it because we can build more houses for more people if we shrink your land. That's how I feel, and that's what we're going to do. Landowners, when they, after they go through racking their shotguns at me, will be like, I don't care about your feelings about my home. You're not just going to take my stuff because you feel a way, right? right? So why are we allowing or entertaining because you feel a certain way? Let's take the guns. And when you look at the firearms being used, people like to say, oh, well, they're using these mass killing machines. Well, ignorance, ignorance is truly bliss. But the fact when you start talking about something that people love and they care about and they're attached to, we quickly start to educate you. So you aren't ignorant on the fact anymore. Simple things like saying, why would you want somebody to have an assault rifle? And I'll stand back sometimes and be really, really kind of kind of kind of ignorant in a mean way myself. I'm like, I don't know many people. I know some, but I don't I don't I don't know many people that have an assault rifle. I'm like, well, yeah, you do. I was like, I don't have one. Even though you see my Facebook photo, you see most of my videos. Hey, I, gotta, I don't have an assault rifle. Like, it's an AR. I said, oh, now I have an AR. That stands for armor. <laughs> That's good. I like that. <laughs> yeah, it stands for armor. It doesn't stand for assault rifle. Exactly, yeah. Nice little nice little mainstream media term. Right, right. You know, play on the, play on the, the shorten it up to make it sound like it's so, so dangerous. But no, I don't, I don't own an assault rifle. Right. Now, my semi-automatic uh, rifles I own, my semi-automatic handguns, those are both semi-automatic, um, haven't done anything to anybody. And because you're using scary terms for emotional fillers, doesn't mean I'm going to give up my freedoms because you feel scared. And even if I did, even if assault rifles really existed in the hands of common people, just because it's called something that you think is scary, I'm still not going to give it to you because you don't have a reason to validate why you need it. Why do you need in Jersey? Strict gun laws, yes? Yeah. Convince me that Newark is a safe place. Newark. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, yeah. Can, and, and Newark is going to be what Newark is, even though you have strict gun laws. Now, would you, if a person had to live in Newark, because say, n- not you personally, I, I wouldn't put this on anybody, but let's just say someone lost their home, right? Mm. They lost their home and you, you got to put your family up somewhere. So you go get the first thing for the cheapest rent you can afford while you get back up on your feet. Let's say I put you in Newark, right? You're paying, you know, six, seven hundred bucks a month, whatever's affordable. And now you have to live in one of the areas that's saturated with crime. And then I tell you on top of that, oh, you're not allowed to have a gun either. Mm. So good luck. Mm. I mean, think about that, mm. right? Yeah. So every day you come outside, you're living in one of the worst areas, but yet every day you come outside um, and you try to go about your daily life, there is somebody sitting in some cushy office somewhere with armed guards and people like say, well, the politicians don't have armed guards. Uh, you're a lie. The mayor has the police department, right? <laughs> right so right. they have literally the entire police department. Right. Local politicians, when they go and work in their cushy offices, well, they a lot of them have security, especially if they're working in City Hall, mm-hmm. right? So they have that protection. What do you have? You have nothing. But we want to put you out in the streets, claim we're cleaning up your neighborhoods, but then tell you that you're not allowed to protect yourself. Then you, when you become a victim of a crime, we demonize criminals. But we don't talk about the fact, well, if so-and-so would have had a firearm, they could have potentially have saved their life. No. We just want to make the gun seem evil before we can spare our feelings. So, no, and I tell your friends I said it. We don't care. I don't care about their feelings. Now, if you want to start debating facts and coming up with real numbers, we can talk about those. The problem is the numbers never work, right? And you, you look at Britain. And I talk to people from the U.K. all the time, all the time. I just, on my Instagram today, I put up a picture of me and a guy that came to NRA from the UK. He comes every year, mm. right? And you talk to him about guns and he's like, yeah, you know, look at the stabbings. I mean, for Christ's sake, man, the UK, everybody's like, all anti-gun is like, we need to model it after the UK. <laughs> all right. Let's model after the UK. Like we didn't fight to be away from them because they're, they're the righteous people, right? We, 
America's never fought against the British to be away from the way that they run things. Cool. Yeah, right? It's never happened. Right? So we want to go run back to adapting their way of life. Okay, fine. Get rid of the guns. Britain did it. What happened? Knives appeared, right? Knife crime skyrocketed. The mayor is now calling for knife control. <laughs> Seriously? Dude, you haven't seen it? Yeah, I did hear that recently. When did that start? Uh, I would say, man, he probably he probably was uh, boisterous about it. Uh, give it give or take thirty days, forty five oh, days oh, ago. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, but I mean, man, it's on the front page front page of all the papers. Like, it's not something he's whispering. He's yelling. <laughs> like, we need knife control, dude. They literally have bins on the corner. You know how you walk past the bins where you can like donate clothes? Yeah. Like in city, they have bins to collect knives. Oh my god! <laughs> right, because the knife crimes, and not to mention. They still have gun crimes, even though guns are illegal. Uh, Vice News went over there and was doing an interview with guys that were standing out with firearms. And these guys not only had guns, they had silencers at the end of them, right? <laughs> For here, you got to go through all kind of crap to get a silencer. That takes roughly a year. But they're standing out with guns, knives, knife control. The, <laughs> and, and, and he says there is no reason... For anybody to leave their home with a knife. If we catch you with a knife, we are putting you in jail. Really? Started with guns. Now it's at knives. <laughs> oh, and now man. the next thing they have coming up is their acid attacks. Now, when you look at the, the shooting they had in, uh, over there, uh, the one at the newspaper, they used legit, fully automatic AK-47s. Wow. How in a country where they aren't allowed? Right. Exactly. How did that happen? And when they went down the street mowing people down, people were hiding up in buildings with their cell phones recording the incident, which is cool. I get it. Mm-hmm. But imagine if a cell phone was a Exactly. Yeah. You know? So exactly. yeah. I'm sorry, I get on a tangent, but yeah, that, that's what you tell your friends. Play this part of the interview, Paul. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, you're you're completely right. You know, people um, you know, they have their feelings and it's almost as if that's sufficient for them or sufficient reason for them to advocate the removal of your rights to protect yourself. You know, it's like, it's like, I don't even know you, but you shouldn't have a gun. <laughs> you know, right. how can you, how can you make that judgment call? You know, like, I don't, what, a, what, what, a, what, what amendment hurts people's feelings more than anything else? The first amendment. Right. 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 So if we start playing this whole emotional restrict your rights because of my feelings game (laughs) and you get the second, the first is next. Don't believe me. Let's go back over to the UK where the incident, you know, the incident, unfortunately, with the child in the hospital and things like that. But the UK started to threaten to arrest people Mm. that have opinions and they've already arrested people for voicing their opinions on various issues. Literally, Mm. you can be arrested over a tweet. Wow. Yeah. That literally is happening in the UK. So once again, they started with guns. Hmm. Now it's down to knives. And now we're controlling and threatening you with jail based off of your voice. And how are you going to resist that? You can't even have a knife. All right? So get in the back of the car, come down with me because you're going to prison. <laughs> Just saying, you want to be like the UK, there's something for you. A First Amendment hurts people's feelings more than anything. You can sit here right now and say anything you want to me. You're in New Jersey. I'm in St. Louis. There's nothing I can do about it, right? right. Nothing I can do. You can hurt my feelings. I can start crying like a baby. There's <laughs> nothing I can do about it but be hurt. My feelings can be hurt. Right. But I shouldn't be able to tell you you can't legally say whatever you said to me. Sure. I shouldn't be able to have you sent to prison because you say, oh, you're the ugliest guy I've ever seen. <laughs> you know what? That hurt my feelings. Lock them up. Right. Like that shouldn't that shouldn't be a thing. But that's exactly what's happening in the UK. That's, that has happened in Australia. And these are the places you want us to model ourselves after. It's happening in Canada. Yeah. Right. <laughs> can't say things. A tweet will get you in prison. But you guys want to do things based off emotions. So you get rid of the Second Amendment because of your feelings and your filler, scary words. Well, next comes the First Amendment. Imagine when you can't get on your uh, Twitter or your Instagram or your Facebook or your YouTube. And you can't really even do it on YouTube now because they restrict a lot of stuff gun people say. But imagine getting on there and talking about how you feel about a presidential election or your local tax codes or, um, you know, your your uh, your local funding for a new football stadium coming to town and you get on there and you voice your opinion that's against the government and they arrest you. Yeah. That's legitimately happening in this world now. Yeah. Right? So I don't want to hear anything about your feelings taking away our rights because <laughs> I'm actually trying to protect you. And that's what a lot of people that want guns to be taken away don't get. Like literally, 
I'm trying to make sure that your life is physically protected, even against me. Like, why if why would I want you having a gun if I didn't trust and believe that you can go about your life? I don't want you shooting at me. Mm. Right. So, yeah, mm. we want people on because we understand it brings peace. Mm. And I'm telling you, that I trust you enough to have that kind of power. And as a human being, I believe the majority of us can wield that power without abusing it. And another thing, I'm trying to protect all of your amendments, your entire Bill of Rights and your entire Constitution. The Second Amendment is just the only one that has this tangible object in front of it that's polarizing. So it's the one that gets attacked the most because there's a physical object that represents it. Right. Um, the First Amendment is is just me and you talking. It could be computers, phones. It's spread out. Guns. Second Amendment tie right in. And it's polarizing because it's an object we can look at. Right. But we don't get on here talking about we want to re restrict people's First Amendment rights, even when here's here's the catch. One of the biggest things people are talking about nowadays is, hey, stop being mean. Anti-bullying campaigns. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. children and some adults are killing themselves because they're being bullied. Well, they're using the First Amendment as a weapon. But you don't hear a lot of people saying, let's take the First Amendment away. And you are there are actually campaigns, a lot of which are ran by people that are anti-gun. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that we need to stop the bullying because kids are hurting themselves. I agree. We don't want kids hurting themselves. We should never want that. However, people are using words to get them to hurt themselves. Well, how come you're not talking about restricting their usage of the words? Because you don't want to attack your First Amendment, but you want to attack my second because you say it's hurting people. Kind of sound like a hypocrite. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, so, so let me give you uh, for me when I talk about um, rights, right? So, so I um, I consider myself a voluntarist and anarchist, and I mean anarcho capitalist, really. And uh, you know, the same way with Tom Woods, and so that philosophy for me, it's more a philosophy of morality. Like, um, you know, three concepts, self-ownership, property rights, and non-aggression, right? And they kind of, they're very much related, right? So self-ownership, basically you own your body and anything, any um, work that you do, you know, the fruits of your labor is 100% yours. <clears throat> and anybody who tries to uh, take from you what you have legitimately earned would be aggressing upon you, would be theft, Right. So that's number one. Number two, property rights, which is basically the similar. You know, you, you, you purchase things with the fruits of your labor and it becomes your property and it's an extension of you. So anybody that tries to steal your property is, again, committing theft and and, uh, you know, you could you could defend yourself for that. And then non-aggression is basically, um, you know, you have the right to not be aggressed upon. And if you are, you have the right to defend yourself. Defensive force. Right. So we're, we're all always against um initiation of aggression but not defensive force right you can <laughs> it is legitimate to defend yourself you know every animal defends itself claws venom teeth fangs whatever <laughs> you know every, mm -hmm. you know every animal in the natural kingdom defends itself uh, whereas people now are like yeah well you don't have to own a gun so so anyway so yeah um so when i talk about these kinds of things not only gun rights but other things too um i i don't use the argument of the Second Amendment. Also, I don't use statistics. And the reason for that is because, uh, first of all, the statistics, if I say a statistic, people are going to be like, well, I saw an article and it said the, opposite, the exact opposite. And so you, uh -huh. you're just going to go back and forth. And it's like, how are you going to get anywhere with that? So I, that's, that's one reason I don't use statistics. And then and then the reason why... <clears throat> um, oh, what, was, what was the other thing? <laughs> um, I, I forgot what I was going to say. Ah, oh, shoot. <clears throat> But um, but yeah, so so yeah, st st statistics for me is is one thing that I kind of shy away. Oh yeah, so I focus I focus on the moral agency. That's what I focus on. Like you know, oh yeah, the Second Amendment, right? <clears throat> so I I don't mention the Second Amendment because for me it's like that's a piece of paper that was written up by people, right? And so if I were to mention the Second Amendment in terms of gun rights, it would seem to me like I'm saying that our rights uh, originated from the Second Amendment. Whereas what I'm telling people is, no, you are, you have innate right to protect yourself. It does not originate from a piece of paper uh, that was written down by somebody that you never met. Um, you know that that's it, it's 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 actually it's an it's a good convenient thing to use maybe in court. But when I talk to people, that's one of the reasons why I don't mention those things. You know, because I want to I want to instill in people this idea that we are all inborn and innate with these uh, fundamental human rights. So uh, I just wanted to get your, your opinion on that. 
I, I agree with I don't actually I don't disagree with anything you said. What okay. I will what I will add to it is is this though. So well, when you said the Second Amendment, you know, and you don't talk about it because it was written by somebody you don't know, it's an eight. Yeah. See, actually, you're right. Well, I don't, we don't know them. Like, that's physically impossible. Right. Um, and you're you're exactly correct. It is an eight. The reason, however, that we have to bring up the Second Amendment is because it was written as part of the law of the land. And that's where they're attacking us is in the law. Right. Like, so they right. want to circumvent the law right. to take away those inalienable rights, right. to take away those innate rights. And the only thing we have in the, the legal spectrum yeah. keeping that from happening is that Second Amendment. Right. Yeah. So uh, that's why it's brought up so much. So I'm not a, you know, coming coming where I, where I come from, when I'm talking to people about gun rights, man, look, I don't lead one thing. I don't talk about politics mm. and I don't lead off talking about the Second Amendment, because what that says to most people is. You're using talking points, mm. right? Politics is dirty and it's nasty. So you're you're arguing and you're debating, and people live and die sometimes by their political views, even if they don't understand them. They just they just live and die by them. Because I made this decision, I got to defend myself, dude. Sorry. Um, and then when you talk, start throwing Second Amendment up at a lot of people, well, they don't they don't understand that. They do want to have a conversation more the way you're having it. Just hey, man, about who I am, the fact that I have a right to do this. Mm. So I see both sides of it, and I think they're equally important because if you are if you lose that debate, let's say with a, a congressman, right? Mm. Let's say you're having that, that debate with a congressman, and let's for, make up a fantasy land, and this congressman and you are having a conversation that is going, his decision off of your conversation is going to determine gun rights in this country, mm. right? You are our last line of defense. and You get you get to call four character, characters before you get to arguing with them. I'm mm. going to say, hey, Bring up the Second Amendment uh, and let him know it's part of the legal system because he's um, he's a congressman and he should know he shouldn't violate the law. Like so, that would be my defense mechanism to say once we start playing in the legal spectrum where you're trying to take away our rights to deny us our human rights, that's why we bring it up. And I and, and you know the people that the the founding fathers that that wrote it uh, knew that. That's why they wrote it because what did we use to escape from Britain? Mm-hmm. You know, so yep. it's like. These things are important because if you want to escape tyranny or prevent it from happening, you have to have these things. And you know what? We need to write this down. That way it can never be taken from people. And yet that's why I think the Second Amendment is important. But I do not disagree with anything you said. And and I think also um, like uh, just, you know, the years leading up to the Revolutionary War, I think the British were trying to disarm the colonists. Do, can, do you know if that's true or not? I, I believe that's true. Yeah, they were. They were. They were uh, limiting guns to, uh, and a lot of people. And then it was easy as just taking them. Mm. You know, what are you going to do? Mm. British Army, what are you going to do? Yeah. Um, it was just taking them because as the resistance of America became stronger, you know, it didn't just happen overnight. Like mm. this stuff built up, right? right like right, right. tensions are building up. Right. People are becoming more. Or, uh, they're using their voices more against you. Certain people are saying, you know what? I'm tired of you. Like this resistance built up. Well, they knew it was building up. So let's hold on before you get too angry. Let's just take these, <laughs> you know, and before they could disarm the entire country, yeah. there was a there was a, a repercussion. And, you know, we 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 made up the biggest cup of tea ever and we had a fight. So <laughs> you know, it's just things. That's what happened. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, so before we go, please get into your aiming, aiming for the truth, and uh, and what exactly is going to happen with that, and uh, you know, if people want to learn more about it, how can they find out? All right. So, um, aiming for the truth is exactly that. Aiming for the truth is a program that's designed around aiming for the truth of vi- aiming for the truth for the uh, reasons that cause violence. So that's what we're doing. We're aiming to kill violence at its roots. <laughs> so we are going to help deal with uh, certain key elements of life that I believe cause people to be violent. Uh, We have subject matter experts come in and speak about everything I'm about to say. Uh, And these experts are also available for people to meet one-on-one and uh, go to their offices and seek more more assistance, okay? And so what we do is I I, I emcee the entire thing because every subject I talk about, I lived it. So I understand how it affects you. I'm not just saying it. I personally went through it. That's why understanding my background, coming from the inner city, seeing death, murder, prostitution, drug dealing every single day. I mean, literally was robbed by my classmates. Like, imagine being held at gunpoint by a dude you have to sit in social studies with the next day. Hmm. Okay? Hmm. So, I understand these environments. I also survived depression. So, the first thing we start talking about is mental illness, right? And so, we address people's mental illness. I do that, and I let you get introduced to people that can help you with that because I want to cleanse your mind. I want you to, you know that you need to work with a clean slate. Gun owner or not, it's not about that. 
you need mental health, we want to get you mental health, right? So we talk about that. Then we'll start talking about employment and employment skills. You know, a lot of people, man, haven't have never really had to write a resume, you know, and they're too shameful to say it. Well, let's let's drop all that. Let's help you. You know, a lot of guys don't know how to tie a tie. You know, I didn't learn how to tie a tie till I was 30 years old. Right. Because no man ever taught me. I didn't have that. You know, I bought the clip ons. Whenever I, I had to do something professional for the PD, I went to the store and I bought a clip on tie. Uh, I never knew how to do a Windsor knot. YouTube literally taught me how to tie a tie because there are a lot of their men don't they're not there. Right. Yeah. So but let's get you those skills and let's let's get you um, um, out there and let's get you employed. So we'll have employers show up. You know, wow. it might not be a pretty wow. job. It might be a local plumber. It might be a local carpenter. You never know. It might be a gun company. But somebody has they're there offering employment. You know, if you can. Of course, they got to you have to be qualified, of course, but they're there to help. Um, so after we talk about that, we're going to get into uh, rebuilding the family and money management. So first we start with money management. So you got a job. Let's teach you how to manage that money or give you the resources to make that dollar stretch. After we make that dollar stretch. Now, let's talk about getting you back involved in with your family, whether it's your extended family or your children. Maybe you you're, you're not the best mom or dad to your kids. Right. Or maybe you and you share it, you co-parent, but you're not the best co-parents or whatever the case may be, because you didn't see fatherhood. You don't know what that looks like, you know. Let's introduce you to that. Let's teach you cost effective ways to get back involved in your child's life. And let's teach, teach you conflict resolution with that. So you don't go into it angry. You understand that it's not about you. It's about the child. Right. And let's get these families rebuilt. That's what it's about. Rebuilding a family. Right. Cornerstone society. We got to rebuild them. After we get the family together. Now, let's focus on your kid for we can have you busy with your child. So let's get your children uh, resources. It could be an alternative school district if they're not learning properly where they're at now. Or it could be something as simple as a tutoring service. Or maybe the scouts, something to get your child out of that everyday environment of what they see, right? And then we're going to challenge you to be involved. So if they have a meeting at school, hey, dad, we want you to go to that meeting. We want you to be involved. And the, the Or mom, we want you to go to the meeting. And that helps people build equity into their lives, right? And so after we've, we've helped you build equity into your life and we've shown you that we are people that care about you by doing things, not only host an event at the event, we feed you. Round trip public transportation is reimbursed. You catch the bus, we'll give you that money back. Okay. And we provide free childcare services on site. So wow. you don't have to worry about, hey, I don't have a sitter. I don't, I don't have this. The hmm. last one we had, we had a miniature corner for kids in the parking lot. Hmm. We entertained the kids while the adult came, adults came inside. Wow. Every family that attends, we have free firearm safety training for the entire family. Hmm. Right. And that's just free. It's at a later date, but that's just free. So whether you own guns or not, your, your kids know how to be safe around them. You, mom and dad, you understand what you should be doing to keep the family safe if they ever do encounter a gun, whether there's one in your house or not. So those are the things we do. Now, after we have you having all that equity built into your life, then there's a question we ask or I ask. And the question is, do you believe, close your eyes, do you believe that whatever resources you choose to use today, there is somebody that will snuff that life out, that will take those resources from you? Unanimously, everybody agrees. Who can, who, who, how can you not? Yeah, sure there. Okay. Now, let's talk about how you preserve that. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the defense of that. Now let's talk about the second amendment. Once people have equity or a life they can see that they have equity into, you don't have to sell them on defending it. Mm -hmm. They want to defend it. My job then is to show you how to do it the right way and give you the history of it. So that's what aiming for the truth is. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. It's, I wish you were in my neighborhood. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, we travel. That's what I was going to get to next. Oh, so, really? Cool. Um, yeah. Aiming for the truth is not just and it's 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 OK. It's on me to make sure people understand this. Aiming for the truth started born in St. Louis, Missouri. Aiming for the truth is for everybody. So we'll be July 21st and it's all be on my social media, which I know we're going to be we're going to talk about and make sure it's tagged. Yeah. But aiming for the truth uh, coming up, we'll be doing a marketing really heavy for it. July 21st. It's going to be in Columbia, South Carolina. So another thing that we, we do with Aiming for the Truth uh, is make sure communities have a chance to interact, right? Like I invite the gun community out to this event, not to show off guns. We don't show off guns at this event, by the way. This is all about holistic human of the person, healing of the person. Mm. Uh, but it's about blending communities. That way we can we can break down other barriers too, whether it be racial barriers or lifestyle barriers or whatever the case may be. Uh, so I'm excited to say uh, that the Aiming for the Truth event in Columbia, South Carolina, you want to talk about optics, you want to talk about diversity and appearance, it's going to be held at a Harley-Davidson dealership. <laughs> How is nice. that for optics? Right? Nice. So 
uh, <laughs> bikers and the community and education. That's going to be something else, man. Um, and then uh, September 1st, we're going to be in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, we'll be going out of Memphis, Tennessee. So um, any, anybody can have it anywhere. It's just a matter of reaching out to us, of saying you want it. And we ask for three to, uh, three to six months in advance. We make sure we lock everything down and we, we, we show up and we do it, man. It, it's not it's not really that hard. So it can be in your area mm. and maybe you can bring it to your area. Hmm. Okay. P putting an idea in my mind. <laughs> uh, l let me ask you a question. Uh, do you Are you familiar with the guy Dale Brown from the Detroit Threat Management Center, the Viper Threat Management Center? I can't say that I am. Okay. All right. I definitely uh, should. I will link you to him. Um, be, I interviewed the guy. He's very similar to your approach. You, you remind me a lot of him, and he he basically um, he does very similar to what you do. He he, but he's a, he's more into private security, and yeah. so he's got his company that. Uh, he goes into Detroit, right? And like basically, the mo a lot of people have fled. The you know the, the tax, um, you know, um, the people paying the taxes basically have fled. But there are still some people there, still some businesses there, but rampant, you know, crime and uh, home invasions and murder and things like that. And so the businesses that are still there and the people that are still there, they want protection. And so he has found a wonderful. Um, niche for him to go there and and satisfy that demand and so he's built up this really thriving business on protect not not only um helping people protect themselves their family at their homes and uh their businesses but also educating the public and so he's really big into self-defense and 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 defense with with a, with a weapon also um and he's really into exactly what you said de-escalation of a potentially violent situation and so he mm -hmm. primarily first first and foremost uses psychology to diffuse a tense situation which is awesome and and he basically we say you know there's there's many levels of failure that um people would engage in you know before let's say you kill someone you know it's like first thing is if you have to put your hand on them that's one level of failure if you have to take them down another level of failure you know all the way down to like really 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 hurting them but you know so he's like pr uh, primarily what we focus on is diffusing the situation without even touching the person just by words just by talking and and so it's really admirable what he's doing so uh yeah i interviewed him also tom woods interviewed him actually as well really really cool guy so i will I'll, I'll link you hit to him i think i think you um you and him i don't know if you can coordinate but yeah <laughs> he's an awesome guy yeah. so okay. that's so, cool yeah so he's really doing some good work uh and, and you definitely remind me a lot of him as well so very cool so thank you very much uh for this conversation before we go um if you could give i always ask this of my guests if you can give one quote that you're that's your all-time favorite your all-time favorite quote <laughs> To leave my. <laughs> to, does it have to be? Can it be? Does it have to be like a famous quote, or can it be my own? Whatever. Oh, well, it can be your own. That's fine. Okay. Whatever you want. <laughs> right. So my my favorite quote right now is one of my own, and is that I am gun control's worst nightmare <laughs> because I am the inconvenient black troop. Ooh, I like that. That's good. <laughs> that's beautiful. Beautiful. All right. So so uh, yeah, I definitely agree with that. That's awesome. So please. Um, link my um or, or reiterate the ways that people can reach you if they want to contact you or find out more information about what you do sure so with the aiming for the truth event if you want to bring that event to your city shoot me an email and just put it in a subject line info about aiming for the truth uh i'll know what you want i'll respond with the, the email format and you can email us at uh noc for no other choice so noc CCW, think about like concealed carry weapon. So NOC CCW at gmail.com. Um, just put it in a subject line. Hey, I want to know about aiming for the truth. I'll shoot you over the email about how you can bring it to your city. Uh, social media contacts. You can uh, look us up on uh, YouTube. It's NOC Firearms Channel. On Facebook, it's NOC Firearms Training. Um, you can also just reach out to my personal page. It's simply my name, Kevin Dixie. That's D as in dog, I X I E. Then there's also another profile on Facebook is KD, which I like to be called. So it's easier, more informal. KD of NOC. So KD of No Other Choice. Um, on Twitter, it is No Other Choice uh, Firearms. And on Instagram, it's at NOC Firearms Training. And those are all the ways you can reach out. Uh, and if you need to give us a call, you can call us at 314-699-4466. Excellent. Yes, please, people, uh, support him, follow him. Uh, reach out to him. He's a great guy doing some wonderful work, and I think we need more 
people like KD over here doing work like this, I think the world will be a more peaceful, civil, <laughs> and prosperous place uh, if we can, you know, replicate this kind of education, this model. Um, you know, I think, uh, yeah, the world would be a better place. So thank you very much for what you do. Uh, KD really appreciate the conversation. Uh, so if, uh, if anybody wants to support me, you know, the links are below. So this is, um, peaceful anarchism on the voluntary virtues network on the seeds of liberty, uh, the, the seeds of liberty podcast and the, uh, the, uh, the conscious resistance network wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye guys. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you will receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.